Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Julia LaRoche Show. Today, we are joined by Charles Payne. He is the host of Making Money with Charles Payne on the Fox Business Network. He is also the CEO of Wall Street Strategies and the author of his newest book, Unbreakable Investor. In this episode with Charles, we explore what it means to be an unbreakable investor despite economic headwinds and this market environment. He also shares his thesis on what he calls the roaring 2020s, the need for pro-business leadership, and reasons to be optimistic about America. He does a nice dive into his own American dream story. I really, really enjoyed that part of the conversation. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed this one with Charles as much as I did. Charles Payne, host of Making Money with Charles Payne on Fox Business, author of the new book, Unbreakable Investor, and of course, CEO of Wall Street Strategies. It is so great to welcome you on the show. And Charles, it's great to see you again. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been too long. Thank you so much. It's great to be back. I know it has been too long. And also, it's really special to have you on because it is your birthday on the day that we're recording. So a very happy birthday to you, Charles. Yes, 29 years old. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you look fantastic. Right. Well, Charles, I want to start where I always start with my guests before we get into the book, and that is to get your big picture view of the markets and the economy, where we stand today. Just kind of what's your assessment today? You know, uh, it's ironic in a way. They're both the same in a sense that the market is bifurcated. Obviously, everyone's been talking about that. That's been the big subject. The magnificent seven or eight uh, in the rest of the market, and the economy is bifurcated in a way that I think is substantial. You know, the uh, the the people who have money have a lot of money, and everyone else is kind of struggling more and more every single day, and it's creating this amazing imbalance. And you know, for me, one of the more frustrating things is we uh, hear economists talk about the economy; they do the whole aggregate thing, right? So you can take ten people, let's say ten households making seventy grand a year, barely covering everything. That's sure how they're going to get their kids in college. At one more household doing five million dollars a year. And just say, oh, wow, the consumer is doing great. Households are doing great. Well, guess what? Not really. And, and, and so I, the only word place I really see that reflected are like in political surveys or, or these political polls where they ask Americans, how do you feel about the economy? Then you see really how, you know, how it really breaks down where most people uh, are saying they're concerned, they're worried, inflation's taking a big toll. And now, uh, you know, upcoming recession, probably going to be an ultimate one-two punch in a negative way. Yeah, bifurcated. Um, so I guess you talk to, a, well, obviously, you know, hosting your show, you talk to a lot of um, folks on the street and in investing. And what is kind of your assessment? Do you think, it sounds like what I'm hearing, you think we're headed for a recession? I think we are headed for a recession. I think a lot of people are in a recession. You can argue there's been a quote unquote rolling recession that's taken out certain parts of the economy already. Uh You know, it's really intriguing because we're in this unique time, Julia, where I don't think anyone ever knew knew how to model it or still maybe don't really, to be quite frank with you. If you think about the beginning of the year, and again, I reach out to the best folks on the street. I do. I I love people who write. Uh, I love people who've been around for a long time. I love people with track records. I'm not just looking for people to come and start talking, right? I really want folks to know their stuff. And so these are really brilliant people for the most part, but they're models and uh, you know, but then again, who lived through in a period where trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars cascaded into the economy at one time? Uh, so everyone kind of got the market wrong. Uh, they got the, the economy wrong. And I still think a lot of that's lingering right now. So I see great opportunities within the stock market. Uh, but I do believe the economy is certainly going to go into a recession. My big thing is just how deep it is depends on the Fed if they if they overdo it. Yeah. Well, when you mention um, the greatest, the great opportunity in the stock market, I know you've often referred to that as the greatest money making machine. And also your book, though, Unbreakable Investor, you even write in the book about the timing of this book. So I do want to hear more on that. The timing. Why now? You know, the book before that was called Unstoppable Prosperity. And it's it's one of the things I want everyone to think that that, that they can have. You know, I think everyone born in this country uh, has been blessed to be born in America, and you have you do have a chance to sort of attain uh, unstoppable prosperity, but you have to do the things that make it happen. And one of the great things about what happened during a pandemic was what I call the new investor revolution. A lot of people poured into the stock market who had never invested before, 
And uh, it was sort of like, you know, the sort of the 1999, 1998 feel to it where stocks were rallying, you know, every all this fresh money was coming in, all this excitement, the fourth industrial revolution, we were right there. You've got AI, you've got robots. It felt like a new paradigm of sorts, right? So it, it was really fantastic. And of course, you hit a bump in the road. And what I started to see were people throwing in a towel. Uh, you know, and and this is a, by the way something that happens all the time when someone takes a shot. You know, they buy a stock, treat it almost as if betting on a football game. Uh, it didn't work out. I'll never try that again. I'm bad luck. Yada yada. You know, the the excuses go on and on. So, my whole thing is when I was a kid, I forgot what grade I was in. I remember we read a poem in school, and it was essentially like this big tree, like this big mighty oak tree, and a blade of grass next to it, and the tree was always bragging. You know, you guys are weak. You're always flailing around. Look at me. I'm standing strong. I never bend. Uh, And then a big storm came through. And of course, as this storm came through, the blade of grass was able to bend, right? And the wind went through. It's sort of that aerodynamic thing. And a tree, the big, mighty, strong tree held up for a long time. But when it finally cracked, it broke. And that's what I want investors to be. Listen, you're going to face, you know, adversity in the stock market. You have to learn how to be able to bend at certain times, which means, by the way, a big focus of the book, I'd say 40%, is on the psychology of, 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 of trying to stay the course, so to speak. Uh, and so you have to learn how to bend so that you don't break. So I don't want you to be, I, I want you to be unbreakable, but that doesn't mean you won't bend or have, face adversity. Mm-hmm. But how about um, with stocks the valua- at the valuations at these levels, still finding them attractive, and also with the prospects of a recession on the horizon? Well, there's two things. First, I look at the stock market as like a shopping mall. When I go to a shopping mall, I don't go in every store. So the stock market is just a place for us to exchange stocks. I don't really care if the stock market PE is a million. I'm looking for individual opportunities. And by the way, at the end of every year, look at the top 50 gainers. They're all going to have crazy outrageous valuations that surists would have missed. And by the way, the peers always miss them, right? And so- uh, there's other ways of, for me, gauging the market. I don't, I'm not a big fan of P-E ratios. I do pay attention to them because I know a lot of money it moves based on them. Uh, but I'm looking at other things. You know, listen, I'm looking at companies that have products uh, that people want and they have organic pricing pro- power, that they're taking market share, that their margins are expanding, that they've got great R&D and they're committed to, you know, their execution is there. I'm looking for those sort of things. So I'm looking at owning a business, a, a, a portfolio of businesses more so than just the overall market. Same thing with a recession. Even in a recession, we'll still be a $25 trillion economy. There are going to be companies within that economy that make a ton of money. Taylor Swift is going to make a ton of money, right? So there, there's going to be opportunities to make a ton of money. So I don't want people to think about the market as much as, as you know, I'm investing in the market. That's where you go to invest. But we're going to go inside this mall. We're going to go to the very best stores. And if we're lucky, we'll go to these places, at, at, you know, because other people have given up on them or, you know, listen, the same tide can lift all ships up and down. We know that. And we try to take advantage of it. Mm-hmm. And that probably goes back to this whole notion, too, of like buying what you know. If you're buying a product or you're using a product and you love a product, why not own the the shares of that product or I'm, company? I'm a big advocate of that. Now, my problem, though, is I'm not hip. So by the time... I- by the time I, I learned cool, about Charles. something, it, it's been, it was cool like four years ago, right? I'm like the last person. Like I'm like, oh, man, this is cool. They're like, uh, yeah, my man, that's been cool for like four or five years. So, that is so, so funny. It's a good starting point. And then from there, there's a, some, somewhat of a checklist to make, to make sure you're not the last person in, right? So, yeah, buy what you know. But one thing I do do in the book, though, is an exercise because we haven't been trained to really connect the dots. We, we listen, the, the industry for the last 100, 150 years has spent a lot of money telling us we can't do it. Uh, you know, for the most part, if you want to be smart, hand your money over to an expert. That's what you do. Uh, you know, put it in an ETF, put it in a mutual fund, give it to someone who's an expert because then they can tell you, you know, after they've gone through the process, I've gone through four months later what's hip, even though you knew because, you know, your friend told you about it yesterday. So there's also like the world around us. When you turn on, when you log on your computer, all these names pop up, all these things, you know, all these licensing agreements. A lot of those are publicly traded companies. People look at this stuff every single day and just never even consider like how much they love the service, how much they love the computer, how much they love the app, whatever, if it's a publicly traded company. So if 
buy what you know, but also understand that your breadth of knowledge is a million times more than you think it is. So allow yourself to always ask, oh, wow, this is intriguing. I wonder if it's publicly traded. Hmm. Yeah, that probably goes back to the, the psychology of it, too. Just buying, again, what you know. Another interesting part in the book, um, and you have a whole chapter on it, is this notion of entering the roaring 2020s. I want to yeah. hear more on that thesis. I'm really excited about the potential. The parallels between 2020s now and the 1920s are just uncanny, particularly the setup. So you think about the Spanish flu, which wiped out millions of people in the late 1900s. Uh, you think about the end of World War I, uh, sort of the, uh, our, our war against terrorism, so to speak, uh, same difference. Uh, you think about the big recession in 2020. There was a massive recession in 1920. In fact, it was huge. It was just dwarfed by the Great Recession, so no one talks about it. You think about the policies that were in place, high taxes. You know, we had just started taxing folks in, in the 1910s, and they went like from single digits to 70 percent. And so, but then you think of what happened in the 1920s. You had a pro-business president back to back. You had Harding. And then, you know, we got an even better president because Coolidge was sort of Harding in terms of being pro-business, but without all the scandals. <laughs> so, so we got a pro-business president who, by the way, loved technology. Uh, he embraced he embraced the wireless, which of course back then was the radio. Think about how the middle income middle class families uh, grew. Uh, auto auto I think automobile ownership was in the single digits by 1930. 25 million Americans had an automobile. Um, you know, uh, um, healthcare health. Our life expectancy grew more in the 20s than any other decade in history. Uh, so, I mean, the parallels, we've entered the fourth industrial revolution. The parallels are absolutely amazing. All we need to do is allow it to work out. You know, I'm not a big fan of the government trying to force me to buy EV. I think if we just step back, we'll get some really amazing things. We already have amazing things in the pipeline. We know about AI. Uh, we know a little bit about robots and, you know, taxis and all of these things. But there are other things even beneath the surface from there. We just allow them to bubble up the opportunities they can create for not just not just for the 20s to 2020s, but even beyond. Yeah. How about the leadership factor in that equation? Because you mentioned, um, you know, Coolidge, for example. How about the leadership part of the equation for, you know, getting us set up for that roaring 2020s that you see? I think that's the one piece that's, that's the, the wild card. Um I, I just, I, I, we cannot have a president who goes to war with business. Um, I think it's been a gargantuan mistake, this whole EV solar thing. And if you think I'm wrong, uh, look at all EV stocks. Look, look at the Rivians of the world, the Lucids of the world. Look at all the solar stocks. Listen, I'm in end phase. I'm down 50% at least, maybe more. I'm afraid to look. Uh, you know, uh, look at solar, so, so, all of them, everything associated with that because there's no organic growth. They're, they're throwing hundreds of billions of dollars at it around the world. But there's no organic demand for this stuff. Uh, and so we're taking hundreds of billions of dollars and we're putting it toward that hundreds of billions of dollars of spending that adds to the debt. But we already know that debt now, uh, these levels now, $33 trillion, uh, these bond yield, these bond options that are not going off very well, particularly long dated bonds. All of that gets back to just, it's a clarion call for us to go get back bit, Bring government out of this equation some, you know, and, and let the organic, natural ability of America uh, take over from here. So we can't we can't have a president who's trying to pick winners and losers in business, particularly one like the oil industry. We're going to need oil for the next 50 years. Why make it more expensive? Why not take advantage of it? Why be, not be smart about it? I think at some point, you know, there'll be a natural desire for EVs and electric vehicles and things like that. But it's not necessarily there right now. Solar, I, I really believe we need to wait another generation or so before it's cheap enough and smart enough. I mean, think about the electric grid, how old it is. All this stuff is stuff. By the way, you know what's interesting about the 20s, uh, about the, this whole EV thing? Tell me. You know, in 1900, in 1900, uh, there were three types of automobiles. There was uh, the steam engine had about 40% market share. Uh, electric had about 30% market share, uh, maybe more, 35%, and, and gasoline had the smallest market share. 
And as we started to build out roads, made them easier to get drive, you can actually drive a few states over without, you know, busting up your tire. And then Henry Ford came up with the Model T, which was 600 bucks versus 2014 B. Uh, the, the marketplace picked the winner. And so I think let the marketplace pick the winners and, and allow us to continue this path of dominance, uh, you know, and excellence, because it's a, it's a more competitive world these days. We, we don't need to hamstring ourselves. You know, Charles, listening to you, I take it um, you're an optimistic guy. And I take it that you're optimistic on America. And I, I want to just bring something up with you. I had a phone conversation with a friend I had not talked to in a long, long time. This was just the other night. And I was kind of, this person was like, the United States sucks. So, like that was their words. I didn't even like further the conversation. But what would you say, what would you say to a young person? I'm not even young. We're millennials. We're not even young. That might feel a little bit jaded about like, the future, if you will, or their own outlook on the U.S. I I understand why they're jaded, um, you know, uh, or you know, spoiled is another word for it. it. It's 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 tough to know where we came from if no one's telling you. It's tough to know how good you have it until you know until you lose it, and you don't want that to happen, right? I spent a lot of time in this book. In the very beginning of the book, I talk about my grandparents. Yeah. And uh, it's a story when I when I first it was a sort of thing in the family where we always kind of talked about it. But I finally got the paperwork, um, the contracts in my hands. It was July 4th. That's when I finished the book. That was the last thing I was waiting for. The publisher was like, come on, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. So I finally got it. And so July 4th, I spent my July 4th, 2023, all day in the house writing, finishing this book and crying. All I did was cry. I cried tears of pride, tears of tears of admiration, uh, because of what my grandfather and my grandmother did, what they sacrificed to get a piece of this country to own their own farm. They gave up everything they had, everything, and and so we. It's easy to take that. Uh, listen, I was a kid. I used to go down to Alabama, Julia, and I hated it. I there was no indoor plumbing. You know, they had the the big cast iron stove. Uh, they were, you know, you had to go to the outhouse. I mean, this is in the 70s, right? I hated it. And I didn't have the admiration for them that they deserved until I became an adult, until I became a parent, till I had the ups and downs of, of adulthood. And I look back, every time I would look back and think, I was ashamed of myself. I was ashamed of myself. I mean, really, I was a snob. I'm these kids you're talking about when it was, was them. So it's... I don't, I don't know how to get to them sooner to make them realize. Sometimes it's like, hey, you know what? Maybe, maybe you know, really go around the world. Not on TikTok. <laughs> you know, maybe take a trip somewhere uh, and, and and see. And just just see what, what, what you have. And that's why I think it's the people who come to this country do so well. Then, if you look at like farm-born versus native-born business owners, they're, they're crushing. They're crushing it. Look at the top uh, yeah, uh, CEOs in these co- co- publicly traded companies. Almost every day they swap out someone who's native born for someone who was foreign born. They see what we have because they didn't have it. They were watching us from afar like if I could ever get my feet on American soil, I'll never, I'll cherish it. We're born into it and we don't realize just how great we have it. So it does hurt me when I hear that. Uh, and sadly, you know, you hear it all, you hear it even more during political year, p- presidential years, how bad we suck or how bad something else sucks. And, uh, uh, you know, we do need some sort of leadership, maybe outside of politics that will will tell people, listen, particularly young folks, you just, we have it really amazing. It's not the story, you you know, your dad had to walk to school for, you know, three miles to go to school. It's where we came from uh, in just a short period of time that's been, by the way, it's been mind boggling how quickly this upstart nation was able to be dominant in the world and to this point still dominant. Yeah, it certainly has. And you did write so beautifully about your grandparents and um, watching your grandmother prepare a meal for your grandfather and the way he ate. And it was just, it was really beautifully written. So I do encourage like the folks to read that. I do want to talk about your own story, Charles, because like in this process of preparing for the interview, I've learned a lot about you, things that I frankly didn't know um, about you know, growing up, you, you've talked about having two childhoods, your own path into investing and into Wall Street. Can you share with the folks your own journey? Sure. Um, I was in the Army, Brett. So, you know, I was born, my dad was in the Army. Uh, and uh, 
It was beautiful. We 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 moved every year. I had two two younger brothers, and so I was born in New York. Then uh, my next brother was born in Pittsburgh, and then the next brother was born in San Antonio. Then we lived in Germany. Then I was back in Pittsburgh. Then we lived in Japan, Okinawa, Japan. Then back to Texas, Alabama, North Carolina, Virginia. And it was just an amazing life, Julia. And it was really, I mean, it was amazing, but it was also, the, it was just shielded, right? Because the 60s and 70s were obviously a very turbulent time in our country. Uh, the civil rights movement, the, the, you know, the generational movements and things like that. I was shielded from all of that. Uh, you know, I mean, we just, there was really uh, color lines or blurred on military bases. You know, no one talked about it. Uh, you know, one of my first best friends is a white guy named Randy Helms. I'd love to look Randy up and find him. To find him. Uh, you know, you just play with everyone. You went outside, you got on the bikes, you guys played all day, came home, made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, went back out and played all day. Uh, you know, we lived in a two-story house. We had a staircase was like the Brady Bunch. It was just a beautiful life. And I came home one day from school. My mom said, we're leaving. So me and my mom and my two younger brothers, we got on a bus and uh, we went from Fort Lee, Virginia, this two-story house where we never locked our doors. And all four of us lived with a friend of my mom um, in Harlem. Uh, and, and in one bed, we lived in a room, to, all four of us in a bedroom together. And it was just, it was obviously there was a massive amount of culture shock. Um, there was an exciting part of it just from the very beginning. Getting on that first subway train was just like, wow, the iron horse. And back then, like, it was like... It was early 70s, and they had trains still running from, like, the late 50s, right? They were really loud, big, clumbersome, oh, man. Uh, but it was just amazing, right, to get out. And then walking up the the, the first time walking up the subway uh, exit and just, you know, the tall buildings, the energy, the music. The music was really amazing, and it was coming from everywhere. Windows, cars passing by, boom boxes, watching girls double dutch for the first time. I'd never seen that. The flip side, of course, was the other part, the extreme poverty and the extreme violence. I never, ever could even imagine, you know, I mean, like I didn't, I had a few fights in my life and they were quickies, you know, you fight your buddy over something goofy and within minutes you were friends again. But these fights, these were to the death and I don't care what the reason for the fight was, you fought to the death. I had a fight one time that lasted 40 minutes and covered three blocks. I don't know how the hell we got three blocks, but when I fought and no one would break it up. <laughs> so, um, and we got picked on, obviously we were different. We sounded like white kids. We wore the wrong clothes. We, we went through pure hell, but it was really even the economic hell that bothered me the most. So as the oldest son, oldest child, I, I had to help my mom. And so initially I would take paper towels and Windex and I would clean windows to stop, stop signs of red lights. Then I got a job at a bodega, which was great. I was shovel snow in the winter time. Uh, because I got to tell you, we got our, we lived in this room for like a couple of months. It was the summertime. And, um, you know, we got our own place by the winter time. But that winter, the whole winter, we went, I think we had heat once. I remember when the cold man came, it was almost the end of winter, like February, March of the next year. And we had a little bit of heat then, but we went through that whole winter. And by the way, this building, every day I would walk out, you have to climb over a wino or a junkie to get in and out of the building. There was no lock on it. Uh, and so it was, it was devastating. I knew I had to help my mom and I would do whatever I made. I would give it to her. But then I was like, this is not enough. And like everybody, I think at a certain age, you equate wealth with Wall Street, money with Wall Street. So I started getting the Wall Street Journal and it was tough. If anyone ever looks at a 1975 Wall Street Journal, it's nothing but lines and lines and numbers. It's like, what the hell is this thing? It took me a while, but I started to kind of figure it out a little bit. And so when I was 14 years old, I told my mom, I said, I'm going to work on Wall Street. And again, I always hustled. Uh, in my neighborhood, we called it we called it scrambling or scrambling, right? That's what I love to do, scramble. I still do that. I wear mm -hmm. like 73 hats. I can't help it. <laughs> so um, I saved enough money to buy a mutual fund when I was 17, and my mom co-signed on the mutual fund. I joined the Air Force when I was 17, went in a couple days after my birthday. And when I got when I was in the Air Force, my first base was in Minot, North Dakota. I went to the Dean Witter office there after I saved up like a thousand bucks, maybe fifteen hundred bucks, and bought my first stock. And that stock did very well. So I was I was in. Yeah. I just want to ask one more question because I'm hearing you tell the story. And your mom 
really played a critical role, I imagine, when you're telling her, hey, I want to work on Wall Street or even co-signing for that first mutual fund. Yeah. How influential is your mother in all this? Everything. I just told my brother that this morning. Everything. Yeah. She did everything. She sacrificed her life for us. Uh, so I, I try my best to live up to, you know, to be whatever the man that she wanted me to be. But she did everything for us. She she really did. She was a warrior. Uh, he just She was an amazing warrior. And so I would not be here today if it wasn't for her. Yeah, she's a superhero too. And I have to say, Charles, you are a wonderful person. You are so kind, so generous. I know you help so many folks every single day. Just give you a few moments to share. Um, where can folks get the book? Obviously, everyone go watch Charles, 2 p.m. <laughs> Eastern, Making Money with Charles right. Payne on Fox of Business. Um, just let folks know where they can find more. Thank you so much again. Thanks a lot. Yeah, definitely. Well, the book is at unbreakableinvestor.com. And in fact, the book is free, although people have to pay for shipping and handling. Um, I'm on every day at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Also, I, I have my own research firm for over 30 years. It's wstreet.com for the free commentary. I write every single day. It's, it's my passion. Uh, you know, it's it's I'm, I'm lucky to be able to do it for a living. And one thing I do, I, I really sincerely want people to do well. I, I really believe that it, it breaks my heart when I see so many Americans not participate in this, the, the greatest money-making machine in history. It's not about getting rich quick, but you can elevate your life to the point where the generations that follow you have it a little easier. I love that. Well, Charles Payne, thank you so yeah. much again for taking the time. We all appreciate you and the work that you do. Thanks thank again. You. Thank you very much.